and I am the Associate Curator here at the C.M. Russell Museum, and I'm very honored to introduce tonight's speaker for this member mixer. Um, we're really lucky to have the grandson of uh, Weinhold Rice here tonight with us. He's going to be able to give us an insight into the collection that he graciously donated to the museum, and also the importance of his grandfather's work, and what it really means to Montana and the Blackfeet people. So if you could please uh, give me a round of applause for Peter, and I will let him start from here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and some dear friends who are here. First, I wish to express my wife Patricia's and my appreciation of the most kind invitation to be with you today and to participate in this event. Can all of you hear me? Yes. I have been asked to tell a story of my grandfather's coming to America, his primary purpose in so doing, and to really describe him as an individual. Additionally, I've been asked to speak of some of those who sat for him including some of those in the downstairs exhibit. Essentially from reading the German author Karl May's stories of the American West and the Indian people, he decided to come to America with the purpose of creating a permanent living memorial to the Blackfoot culture and way of life. He planned to do so by painting very accurate and true to life portraits primarily of the Blackfeet and the Blackfoot nations. He was first able to come to Browning in 1919, 103 years ago. He arrived by train during a blinding snowstorm one evening. As we know, that hasn't changed. <laughs> the next morning, he stepped out of the hotel into a beautiful, clear, sunny morning after that cold front went through. And walking down the street, he saw three men standing, talking, two of average size and one very tall and powerfully built. He walked up to them. He had been told that the way one should first greet an Indian was to walk up to him, slap him on the back, and shake his hand. So this he did to the very tall man who looked down at him quite startled. <laughs> My grandfather then told him that he wanted to paint his portrait, to which the man replied, no, my house, it does not need to be painted. <laughs> Enol then clarified his intentions, and the man, quite amused, agreed to sit for him. And so our relationship began which was to eventually become one of my grandfather's closest friend relationships with the people of the Blackfeet Nation. The man was Turtle, a great and courageous grizzly hunter. I'll tell you a little bit about Turtle. He would cut two juniper sticks, sharpen all four ends, and tie them crosswise with rawhide and drive them. He would then go up into the mountains and agitate a grizzly. <laughs> which rumor has it, to this day, it's not really that difficult to do that. <laughs> he met with considerable success. The grizzly would then charge him with his mouth open. Turtle would then thrust his sticks into the bear's gaping mouth. The bear would close and close its mouth, and the stick would penetrate up into its brain killing him instantly. Wow. Yes. Legend has it that this happened many times. If 
fact, we have a painting at home of Turtle wearing a bear claw necklace. So we have evidence that it actually did. In the 28 years that followed, Turtle sat for my grandfather numerous times. My grandfather was a really fun-loving man. He loved and truly shared the sense of humor of his Indian friends. He had a very neat, mischievous spirit. In many ways, he really was snappy. My grandfather had as well a real teacher side to him. Through the years, he gifted many Indian children the rudiments of drawing and painting. A number of these children went on to become distinguished artists in their own right. He instinctively truly was nappy. Vinold's, and his pronunciation is Vinold, Vinold Rice, he had a deep, innate respect for people that was well known in many circles. And just to jump away from the Pacific, or from the Northwest for a moment, he wanted to paint people down in Mexico. And he was told by many people, listen, there's a civil war going on there. Do not go down there. You will be killed. Well, thank you. He didn't uh, see it quite that way. And he went down there. Thanks, Patricia. He went down there. And what he would do is he had an old Woody station wagon. And he'd drive out into the prairies, the desert, and he'd build a fire, had it all ready to go, just had to light it, and he would go to sleep. And time after time, he would wake up in the morning, and he'd be surrounded by one side or the other in the revolution. And one day, he woke up in the morning, as he had many times, and he looked around, and there were about 30 the revolutionaries standing there and right sitting on horses and he got up lit the fire under the coffee pot gestured to them to get coffee he got his colored pencils out and his paper and started drawing he right away figured out who was the boss that wasn't hard to do at all and he painted he drew him and here's a man picture that. and when he had drawn this, the uh, <coughs> chief said to one of his henchmen, obviously, what, in Spanish, what's he doing? So he said, well, he's painting your picture. He said, I want it. And my grandfather, who spoke very little Spanish, but enough, said to him, I'll tell you what, if, if, you, I, if I draw another one for you, if you will sign both, I will give one of them to you. And they really respected the fact that he had that kind of courage to uh, stand up like that. And it turned out this fellow in the picture was one of the major revolutionaries of that entire area district of Mexico. And he spread the word around that the eccentric German artist <laughs> who drove the old Woody station wagon was his dear brother, and he was to be left alone. And anyone who would hair, harm a hair on his head would have to deal with this particular chief. So he did that a number of times. He gave me a lifelong gift when I was five, and that was a long time ago. One day we sat on a bench that my father had built in front of the farmhouse that Dino had bought in 1938 and whereat I lived for many years of my childhood and my adult life. And he drew a picture of the Vimpies and Commanders, the little people of the forest, or of the forest. You can see from the side of the school, either it's a huge middle school or else they are kind of quite small. You can see they're tickling one of them's tickling him sleeping. I'll keep these up here so you can walk up and see them. And he said to me, he said, uh, he handed to me and said in a strong German accent, Peter, there is one thing that I want you to promise me. 
and that is that you will never be jealous. Jealousy is a terrible thing. He had over the previous preceding years experienced real pain from jealousy directed at him by others. As you might imagine, my eyes were pretty big when I replied, Bono, oh, I promise you I will do my best to never be jealous. And I guess it indicated just how much I admired and adored him. Honestly, I have never felt jealousy, literally, probably because he kind of immunized me against it. He had a very powerful personality. When I see or hear of someone who has done has something that I don't have, I am happy for them that they are so blessed, especially, honestly, especially when they have really earned it. I have probably wondered hundreds of times what else he would have taught me had he not had his totally debilitating stroke when I was eight. In 1954, ashes were spread by the tribal council, including many of his friends from the previous 20 to 30 years, some of whose portraits you will see today. This was on Red Blanket Hill, a deeply spiritual place to the Blackfeet, 20 miles northwest of Browning. When we were in Browning for the opening of the exhibit at the Museum of the Plains Indian this past spring, Cheryl Zwang, the great-granddaughter of two of my grandfather's closest friends, Julia Ways in the Water and Ways in the Water, took us there twice, thereby fulfilling a nearly 70-year fervent wish of mine to visit the site of full integration of my grandfather's remains into the land of the Unscapi Pikuni, whom he so loved and admired. Incidentally, my, grand, my grandfather's farmhouse is in a trust for my daughter and her two children, Vino's great-great-grandchildren. They are the fifth generation of my grandfather's family to live there. My father often spoke of Vino's. The love of a farm and of his family, so I can well imagine what this would have meant to him. <coughs> Through his portraits, Vino did create the dreamed of memorial. When I was 21, I was gifted in his direction a collection of his paintings. However, I always felt that I did not own them, but that I was a keeper and that they were to be eventually in a location where they could be truly enjoyed by people of the Blackfoot Confederacy of the US and Canada, and thereby to help keep the culture and traditions alive in the hearts and minds of today's and succeeding generations. In 1986, <coughs> the C.M. Russell Museum hosted a major exhibition of 96 of Vino's works, including my collection. Their interest in the collection was such that they agreed to various conditions of ownership, some unusual, including that the collection shall always remain the property of the museum, thus guaranteeing that they will always be within reasonable distance for viewing by the more than 17,000 people of the Blackfeet Nation and the thousands of people of the Blackfoot Nation in Canada. Further, the C.M. Russell Museum is a pride of the people of Montana and would never lose their support, as we can see. <laughs> Therefore, I feel 100% confident that it will permanently be their home. Also, I feel that the works of Charlie Russell and Vino Rice absolutely complement one another. Each one in its own style, beautifully illustrating so differently fundamental aspects of our West. Additionally, they each had a deep and profound love and respect for the Native American people 
To me, they really belong together. This collection and others throughout the world of my grandfather's work guarantee permanent fulfillment of his intention of a permanent living memorial to the Blackfeet people of their spirituality and their culture, and to help in building awareness thereof among visitors from across the country and across the world. In 2006, Chief Old Person, the lifetime chief of the Blackfeet Nation for over 50 years, while extending to me the greatest honor of my life, gave me the name Pitaputa, or Flying Eagle, the most appropriate name since my father's name given to him in the 1920s is Three Eagles. My uncle Hans's name is Netapata, or Lone Eagle. He was so named because of his solo climbs of most of the peaks of Glacier National Park. Additionally, for many years, I flew Boeing 707s, 747s, and DC-10s through and over Montana, off and over Glacier National Park. And believe me, it's just as beautiful from 39,000 feet as it is when you're down in it. It's different. And the Blackfeet Nation. Vino's Blackfeet name means beaver child, given to him due to his remarkable energy and industriousness as a portrait painter. Fifteen years later, I had the honor of presenting Chief Old Person here at the museum with the Heritage Award in recognition of a lifetime of statesmanship. I would like to add that while I have worked in 64 countries between my flying and aviation as an aviation security consultant, I have never experienced such incredible hospitality as Patricia and I did when we were embrowning this spring. It was incredible. I would like to bring to your attention the existence of a set of four volumes, over 1,500 pages, of truly incredible information about the people of the Pikuni, or Blackfoot and Blackfeet people. And this is it. This is one of four volumes, and this one the others are heavier, so I brought this one. This, <laughs> this one will be, will be up here for, for you to look at. And I just recently was able to acquire one through Amazon, so they're still out there. It discusses their culture, their ceremonies, their history, and many individual detailed biographies. Additionally, there are quite a number of excellent color reproductions, for example here, of Vino Rice's portraits and many black and white photographs taken through those years by his son Chiark, my father. These are the Blackfoot papers. They're written by Adolf Henry Wolf. I treasure my set. I, it is truly my most valuable written reference on the, on the Pakuni people. While costly, believe me, they are well worth the price. Also, two excellent books on Vino Rice's various works in other domains were recently published in the past couple of years. Here they are, they'll be up here for you to, to have a look at and see if you want to order them. One of them was, see, recently there was an exhibition of his work at the New York Historical Society and that's what this one of these two books is a book about. A number of the Blackfeet and Blackfoot people came up to us during our days in Browning to tell me that your grandfather's pictures are sacred to our people. For many years, our people were not allowed to speak our language, to t attend our schools, to study our culture, our traditions, our religion, our history. Your grandfather's pictures kept our culture alive. Without them, our culture would be dead. And we heard that from a number of different individual Blackfeet people said that. And I thank you for your kind attention.
I have a question. Do you want to elaborate a little bit about your surprise when you were inducted into the tribe by um, Chief Earl Person in 2006, I believe it was? Yes, it was absolutely amazing. I was thrilled. As I say, it was the greatest time of my life. Yes. Well, my father was, uh, his name was W-I-N-O-L-D, T-J-A-R-K, a Norwegian name, middle name, R-E-I-S-S. -S. So the way that often would be, he was often called, why don't the shark Reese? <laughs> I'm, uh, I have two of those names, Jark Rice, my middle and last name. Patricia, when we were married, took my middle name, so she has to deal with it too, the two, the Jark versus Jark, which happens to mean a small wooden boat with a sail, I was told by an old ship captain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, as a little boy, did you have any idea that you would be inducted into the tribe? Did you ever sit and watch him paint? Yes, I did. This in, is my not much. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Not much, but uh, because when I was eight, he had this devastating strike, I, or a stroke rather. I do remember being in his studio in New York, and I have certain memories of that, climbing around the couches and this kind of thing like little boys do. And we, he was just so much fun. When we go down, we, Bama was I called, and I would just, he always had time for me, but uh, I did see him at times paint, and of course I saw him do this this one, which, uh, as you can tell, had quite a, an impact on my life. And uh, but as far as that, he was in bed, uh, helpless, due to a stroke that absolutely immobilized his left side for two years. So. Uh, I didn't see him as much. Yes. Yes, sir. Are you finding as much interest today or even more in the history that you're relating to us today, which is fascinating? Pardon me? You can say Are you that. finding more interest in the history that you've lived and your family have today? Or is there more inquisitiveness? Yes, except for one thing. I, it's not me that the interest is, should be in so much. It's more of my grandfather's works and my grandfather and the subjects that he painted. I really feel that uh, his purpose, as I say, was really to create a permanent living memorial of your people, definitely. And I find that there's more awareness of it. It's, uh, and I think particularly here, and I really believe that obviously the Russell Museum's interest and in, in exhibitions of his work have had a key integral part in that. People are becoming more and more aware of his, of his work and his history. Yes, sir. Question. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, there is a U there's a YouTube video out there, and I. Do you the remember? New York Historical Society. They do two videos. Of one, they just did the exhibition, and one where I showed it with music, and then the other one where they're talking about the history. Did he let you see? Yeah, he was. There are two videos out by the New York Historical Society that we mentioned earlier. One of them, they go around and give a description, and a very accurate description of. Much of his, much of his work, the uh, different, uh, different uh, restaurants that he designed and hotel interiors that he designed, and then he was very active and very, very much appreciated in Harlem during the 1920s. And a lot of work that was done in Harlem. There are 21 of the portraits that he did in Harlem. The prominent, the prominent American blacks that are in the Smithsonian and the National Portrait Gallery. Question. Yes. Two questions. Yes, sir. Do you have any children, number one? And number two, are you an artist as well? 
Well, I am embarrassed to say, well, first of all, I do, I do have a daughter, yes, who is an artist. And uh, it me, I, uh, I guess you'd say, as was said by John Gillespie McGee, a fighter pilot of World War II, I soared free from the bonds of Earth. And that's kind of where when I was nine years old, I decided I wanted to be an airline pilot. And I took after my mother's side of the family. Her father was a pioneer aviator who, in fact, was involved in Montana as, as well, in Montana, in Montana aviation. But no, I am, I am not, unfortunately. I really appreciate it, but I'm not. Yes, ma'am. We're all hearing the horrific stories about the boarding schools in the United States and Canada. Yes. Was your grandfather in one of the boarding schools? I, he, I am sure knowing him, and this is just from knowing him, I would say that he witnessed that. He saw what was happening. He knew what was happening. And Carl Mai, who was the German author, was an incredible author, absolutely incredible. He wrote about the American West and the American Indians, particularly the Blackfeet and Blackfoot. He wrote stories about them that were extremely accurate, extremely accurate, and he wrote them so well and so in such exciting manner that many young German boys and European boys ran away from home, ran away from Europe to come over here to America. And uh, he was sort of one of those, except he was in his 20s when he came over. And he came over specifically to paint them. So I have no doubt, he, oh, he when I was a boy, I remember him say, talking to me about some of those things. That's something I do remember, yes. I'd just like to mention some of my first memories of your grandfather are the railroad posters. I did experience them firsthand when a little bit younger than that, but his railroad posters just are phenomenal. Thank you. I love them. I've, I've, I've bought a couple of them online from uh, Amazon and uh, a couple other places, eBay, but uh, they are, they're remarkable. They really are. I, 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 I appreciate that. Thank you so yep. much. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Does that work? My boss here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not trying to end the party. I just want to let everyone know that Peter is going down to Gallery 10, where he will continue to answer questions and talk about different portraits that are actually in the gallery. Um, so we do ask that you leave food and drink inside this room because um, they cannot go into our galleries, but then you're more than welcome to come back, finish your drinks, and enjoy uh, the rest of your evening. So thank you.